Well, that was actually a good intro to just kind of getting the basics uh, of, um, you know, in interlaminar and transforaminal technique. And I think when we'll all go in the lab later and kind of really um, get the details of, of how to do that technique in a, in a reproducible fashion. So I'm going to talk about uh, what we call the, the benefit zone of endoscopic spine surgery. Why would you want to incorporate endoscopic spine surgery into your practice? And I want to start off with this quote, you know, the, the farther back you look, the farther forward you can see. And really, I think that's important for, for understanding um, endoscopic spine surgery and, and where we started and where we're going. So let's start off way back, 1829, the first lumbar laminectomy. It was performed in, in the US, and at that time, most surgeries ended in mortality and morbidity. I mean, we're talking about 90% mortality rates for surgeries. And that's, that's pos probably because that was before anesthesia. So actually, the, 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 the first laminectomy was actually a wide awake laminectomy, I think. Uh, Albert's taken it going all the way back. And, and um, I think at the end of the day, we, we're, we're seeing that spine surgery, when it first started, was, was very premature. And it wasn't until, actually all surgery was premature. It wasn't until the 50s and 60s we saw germ theory, we saw um, you know, uh, the antiseptic technique principles. And that's when really surgery just took off. We, we saw the first uh, ORIF, we saw the first brain surgery, the first appendectomy, the first uh, heart surgery, and that was towards the end of the 19th century. But really, if you look at it, 1856 was when the first endoscope was made. And that was actually before all these surgeries. And actually, the first endoscope was actually this long tube filled with mirrors, and they had this little chamber. Um, for, for getting illumination, you had to use uh, burning kerosene. And they would stick this in, in patients' urethras. And, um, and uh, you can imagine it didn't end, end pretty well. But I mean, that's our first experience with uh, endoscop uh, endoscopes in surgery. And really, for the most part, it was just diagnostic. And then, you know, 1895 with the, with the development of the x-ray, and that's when really um, orthopedics and spine surgery really started taking off when we were able to visualize the, um, the bony anatomy. And the first 50 years of the 20th century, really it's the rapid evolution of, of, of open spine surgery. We had the first fusions, we had the first cervical laminectomies, really the, the basic building blocks of spine surgery were being developed. And um, at that point it was just big wax. It wasn't until the 1950s when the development of the microscope happened. And the, the microscope plus two more inventions, the, the MRI and the CAT scan in the, in the 70s and 80s, really changed spine surgery. We moved from these big open spine surgeries to these uh, what's called the, the microsurgical spine surgery. And we saw the, the first idea of minimally invasive, which was the Wilsey approach, which is the idea of, of not, not doing subperiosteal dissection. And then we saw Williams borrow techniques from Europe and when the Williams retractor and then the McCullough retractor and really popularized the inner laminar approach, which really was the, the mainstay of, of what's called non-disruptive spine surgery. And in parallel, we had, in the 1930s, we had the first laparoscopic sur surgery, and that was in Germany, and that was lysis of adhesions. And really, not much was going on prior to that. It was just endoscopes using for diagnostic purposes only. And then we saw the invention of the color TV in the 1950s, and, and then we see something happen in, in, in surgery. We see the first arthroscopic meniscectomy in Japan in 1962. And then we had this almost fervor for using cameras to visualize inside the body. Then we had the first laparoscopic appendectomy in 1983. And all while this is happening, this minimally invasive revolution in, spine, in, in surgery um, didn't really quite make it to spine surgery yet. In, in the 70s and 80s, we saw what's the precursor to endoscopic spine surgery, which is in, in Japan, Hijikata, he did the percutaneous nucleotomy, essentially taking a, a large cannula, sticking in the disc space, and um, Cambin in, in in Pennsylvania was able to actually expand on the technique. And CAMBA actually reported 88% success rate. And you know, how, how, how could someone just stick a cannula in a disk space and get an 88% success rate? Well, well, at that point, the outcomes we're measuring is excellent, good, fair, and poor. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it leads to say subjective. But at the end of the day, that was the precursor. And um, we saw the next, next 50 years, we saw this battle between the microscope and the endoscope. And it wasn't until 1986 where really we saw um, all laparoscopic and arthroscopic surgery really take off is because we were able to, to get the, the better visual imaging on these, on these cameras. And then you see this fervor in spine surgery. You see 
the, the thoracic VATS procedure. You see this is a procedure where, the, where they're doing thoracic discectomies with the, a with the, um, uh, laparoscopic camera. Then you see laparoscopic A-lifts. You see laparoscopic discectomies. And you know, if you look at the, the data, it was, it was horrible. I mean, it, this, uh, the, it was high morbidity, high mortality. And really, it was, it was kind of um, made a lot of surgeons in spine surgery, at least, stay away from um, the camera. And then you had in 1996 the, the, the first lateral inner body fusion. And actually, the first lateral inner body fusion was done with an endoscope. It was done in 1996. And if you look, that's the first publication of going trans He actually insufflated in the, in the um, um, retroperitoneal space and then was able to dissect through the psoas and then, and then put a cage in there. And that actually was the basis for Pimenta's uh, lateral interbody fusion in 1998. And then 1997, we saw you know, the, the use of the endoscope for tubes. And that essentially morphed into just, you know, first we had a tube. The first tubes were uh, having an endoscope um, pretty much at the end of the tube. And that formed into what we see the tubular surgery that we see practiced today. So you see the, the initial um, fervor for, for cameras was kind of beat by the, by the microscope. But in this parallel world, we saw that the first generation of endoscopy was still kind of developing. And that was really Kanban. In the 1990s, he, he finally was, it converted the percutaneous nucleotomy to actually be able to see what you're doing. So what he would do is he put the cannula in there, take some disc out, and then see what he did. And essentially, that was before the idea of the working channel endoscope. And it wasn't until uh, Tony Young and, uh, in 1999 developed the endoscopic spine system. Actually, we have uh, Tony's son here today who can probably tell us a lot more about that system. But I, I think the idea at that point was we went from the first generation where we were just sticking things in discs and then taking things out, and that was the inside out. Then we went to the working channel. We're going to see our instruments as they go into the disc. And it was the uniportal working channel, really a precursor to what we do today. But then the question is, by the year 2000, how come no one really did endoscopic spine surgery? I mean, that's 20 years ago. No one really did it. I mean, Dr. Young did it, but I think uh, some people, um, surgeons all across the US had some reports of doing it, but it wasn't very popular. And that was because for microsurgical techniques, there's uniformity in approach, it was familiar, it was ease in adoption, and the outcomes were pretty reproducible. And the indications were very clear. And that's why it, it was the gold standard in the, in the beginning of the 21st century. What about spine endoscopy? Well, it was very unfamiliar. It was a large um, technical learning curve. And there was very limited learning opportunities. Uh, at, at that point, you had to really go and seek it out. And it wasn't available to everyone. And there was a lot of this fear for catastrophic complications. The, the quality of the imaging wasn't so good. And really, the early outcomes, it wasn't as good as microsurgical techniques. And the idea was that most endoscopic surgery was inside out. We go into the disc. And if you have a sequestered disc, you forgot the disc. You didn't get it. You just got the contained disc herniations. And then the indications, they were limited versus poor. You, then you start seeing um, surgeons adopt endoscopic spine surgery for black discs, for annular tears. And really, what, what happened is that the spine community threw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's why there was slow adoption. Now, let's talk about current full endoscopic spine surgery. Now, really, in 2000, we saw in Germany, Hoogland developed this outside-in transforaminal approach. This is the first time we're not going straight into the disc where he's doing a foraminoplasty before he goes into the disc. And that's this concept of, of looking before you attack the pathology. And in 2005, we saw uh, Rutten in Germany really kind of borrow from the inner laminar technique, um, from, um, from microsurgical technique, and, and start using that for, for endoscopic spine surgery. So this was a third generation. This is uniportal, outside in, working channel endoscopy. And from 2005 to 2020, for the past 15 years, we see the rapid explosion. We see improved technology. We see better cameras. We see expanding indications. We see the evidence growing and worldwide adoption. If you look at the, just the amount of uh, publications in the past uh, you know, 10 years, you can see it's just skyrocketing. And since 2016, if you look, it's interesting that most publications are from China and South Korea. And the US is number three in that list. The question now becomes, we just saw in the past five years, we're seeing you know, this idea of bipolar uh, endoscopic spine surgery. The question is, is that going to be the fourth generation? Is there going to be some, some combination of that? 
So if you look at current full endoscopic spine surgery, there's really expanded indications, pretty much all disc herniations, uh, lumbar stenosis, thoracic, cervical. We're talking about revisions, fusions, tumor, infection. Really, it's, it's expand, it spans the gamut. You can use it for everything. Now the question is, how is, is the endoscope advantageous? Well, the working channel endoscope provides a, a, a field of view, about 0 to zero, 15 or 30, depending on the scope you have. And that, that allows for being able to look um, and look uh, around angles, or look, uh, um, look under corners, essentially. Now you can see that the diameter gives you the maneuverability, plus the field of view, it really lets you kind of, again, cut around corners and preserve bone. And you can see that this is a, a CAT scan of a tube versus an endoscope. You can see how, how much bone is, is taken out with a tube versus an endoscope. And that's because that, that simple ability to, to look around corners. And then what about why, why is it advantageous? Well, the transforaminal approach, uh, it, it's, it was novel because it allows access to different regions of the spine that you couldn't access before. Uh, first, we can, first it makes sense we can access foraminal pathology and extra foraminal pathology, but then we can also access the ipsilateral lateral recess. We can access the ventral epidural space. Really, we can remove discs, shave down vertebral body osteophytes, and you know, Osama did a great job presenting uh, uh, how you can see the traversing nerve root after you um, uh, remove a gel ligament and some superior articular process. And really, that, that allows for you to, to safely shave bone ventrally, which you couldn't do before safely. And then in terms of biomechanics, this is perhaps the, the, the least destabilizing approach in spine surgery. This is you know, from the, the masters, Punjabi and White, in 2007. They, they looked at the, um, the difference in foraminal area comparing a posterior approach versus transforaminal, and there was way more uh, increase in foraminal area with no concomitant uh, increase in stability. And I, I think that goes to say a lot. The transforaminal approach is a very uh, powerful technique, and I think for certain pathology, it's, it's great that we have that in our tool belt. The question then becomes, when is it advantageous? Well, we all know, for the most part, endoscopic spine surgery is for decompression procedures. And we all know that a good decompression is a happy patient. But we all know that not all decompressions are equal. This is a thoracic disc. And a lot of decompressions can vary in their evasiveness and complexity. And this is a, a TLF case that backed out. So, the, the point of this talk is to talk about the benefit zone. The, and the benefit zone really is that the benefits of endoscopic spine surgery really increase when the alternative options become increasingly invasive and complex. And we're going to start with just the, we're going to go through three tiers, low complexity, uh, moderate complexity, and high complexity, and kind of see where the benefit develops for endoscopic spine surgery. So for the herniated disc, let's get some, some basic benchmark data on open discs. Some of the best data we have is from the SPORT trial in 2006. Now, look at, this is just the basic, we have a reoperation rate about for two years, about 7 to 10 percent, a, a recurrence rate about 3.2 percent, and overall, if you look at the overall complication or adverse event rate, it's about 20 percent. Now, that seems very high, but these aren't serious complications. You're just literally just listing what problems happen after the surgery. Why did the surgery not go exactly as planned? And that number is pretty high. Let's look at the first endoscopic randomized control trial. We see a prospective randomized control trial, 100 patients, 100 versus transforaminal versus um, um, open micro disc. You see no real difference in outcomes. Reversion recurrence rate are pretty much the same. But we start seeing this trend towards less post-operative post pain and less use of pain meds post-operatively, less work disability. And really, we start seeing this idea that Dr. Mahan published before is this, this complication rate's lower. We see 10% in endo versus 25.2. Again, these aren't really, really serious complications, but they are complications in the strictest sense. Now let's look at the numbers again. These are the, the list of the complications that exist. And, and most of the complications for endoscopic were just reoperation for recurrence. And that's 10% versus 25%. You can see we have wound complications, paresthesias, hematoma, infection. So let's go talk about the next randomized control study, because I'm looking at only the best data that's available right now. And this is a study um, from 2017, perspective, 74 patients transforaminal, 69 open disc. We see, again, functional outcome is pretty much the same. Revision rate, pretty much the same. Complica complication rate is similar. Um, but again, the most common complication for a transforaminal approach is just transient dysesthesias. So I think we're, we're trying to see that the qualitatively the complications are different. And one important thing that I, I, that I saw is that in a lot of publications that the endoscopic group had less leg pain at two-year follow-up. And, and what, what I think, this is probably due to less retraction. I mean, that's the basic, that's the only way I can understand why is there less 
leg pain, and it's because with the endoscopic technique, you're really not retracting. And endoscopic group was more satisfied with the procedure, shorter hospital stay uh, as, as, uh, as expected. Now this is a really, uh, really recent article that came out um, about a year ago. This is from the Netherlands, a prospective randomized control study one year out. And again, similar outcomes. You know, we're seeing the trend here. It doesn't matter what you do. If you take the disc out, patients will get better. But the endo group, as expected, has less opioid use. And again, we see the same trend, greater improvement in the leg score at one year. Again, is it because there's less retraction? I think that's a, that's a hypothesis that I'm, I'm going to stick with. And again, the complication rate is pretty much the same. You can see that there is definitely more complications in the open group, but the, again, it's non-significant. So let's talk about the risk, pro risk profile for lumbar discectomy. If you look at it, really, it's, it's uh, you know, we, aside from this, for the most part, the complication profile isn't that bad for, for a discectomy. And that brings the point is that for a low complexity and low invasiveness case, like a discectomy, really the benefits of endoscopic surgery are really marginal. I mean, we're, you know, you, it may be great for marketing, but at the end of the day, if you're looking at the real data, we need a very high powered studies to be able to detect these differences because they're so subtle. But let's talk about more moderate complexity, the invasiveness uh, uh, with spinal stenosis. Why is this more moderate? Yeah, it's a simple lamy, but the patients are more complicated. You have patients who are older. You have patients who have more comorbidities. You have patients who are higher risk of complications. And then you have patients who have spondies and, 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 um, and scoliosis as well, which complicates the picture. So uh, these laminectomies aren't just so straightforward. And the best way to understand that is look at the, again, the best data. The best data is randomized control, control studies. And this is a study from the New England Journal medicine, looking at um, um, 247 patients, the Swedish spinal stenosis study. Uh, they were randomized to um, decompression versus decompression infusion, and they had a subgroup analysis of people who had stable spondies. Really, again, it's interesting, no difference in clinical outcomes, um, but the reoperation rate, there was no difference. Um, so really, for, for stable spondies, no difference between decompression and infusion. But you can see the reoperation rate is still pretty high, 22% uh, versus 21% decompression. And let's look at the adverse events. Um, these adverse events aren't trivial. I mean, for open lumbar laminectomy, a basic lumbar laminectomy, we're looking at a rate of adverse events of 40%. I mean, I know no one's going to say that, hey, I have 40% adverse events with my laminectomies, but, but this is the best data. And, and for fusion, it's 45%. So the idea is that we're seeing that these open procedures they're not as benign as we think. And that's a, it, it's always easy for us to say it's benign because we're not the patient. You look at the SLIP study. Again, another great randomized control study. 66 patients. They looked at non-mobile, single-level, grade one spondies. Again, the outcomes were similar. But they did have a very marginal improvement uh, in the fusion group in the SF36. But again, the fusion group had higher EBL and higher hospital stay. But again, we're looking at this, and the reoperation rate for an open LAMI for a, a non, uh, stable uh, one uh, level grade one spondy is a 34% reoperation rate. That's pretty high. Uh, versus 14% for decompression infusion. So I think what we're looking at is, is these procedures, whether you do decompression or effusion, in certain, suspect, uh, certain su uh, uh, subgroups of patients are showing higher adverse events. You can see this open lumbar lamby, 40% adverse events versus 20% for fusion. Now again, sports study, just one more study. This is the last study for um, looking at good data. Reoperation rate at two years, 7%. Reoperation at four years, 13%. And their rate of adverse events for the sport trial, 37%. Now, what about endoscopic spine surgery for stenosis? This is one of the few randomized control studies looking at um, treatment of, of uh, spinal stenosis with the endoscopic approach. Clinical outcome, no difference. But look at the complication rate. 1.2% versus 8.8 for their open, open group. And obviously, less opioid uh, use, quicker discharge. And Christoph published this, uh, as well as Dr. McGrath, uh, this retrospective cohort study looking at just comparing endoscope versus a tube. And you know, we saw that the endoscopic surgery, as Christoph was described this when he was first starting, um, was obviously a lot, lot slower. But the hospital stay was still a lot shorter for the endoscopic patients. And then at one year follow-up, there's less back pain, less leg pain, less disability in the endoscopic group. And this was all significant. And most important, the reoperation rate. At one year, the endo group had 2% reoperation rate versus the, even the tubular group had a 7%. This is better than open. So we're saying open's the worst, tubes, right, you know, better, and endoscopic's better than that. 
And you can see the adverse events, okay, 26% um, versus 8%. So we're, again, we're seeing this pattern where, where endoscopic really has this less complications, a very favor, favorable risk profile. What about an isolated radiculopathy and scoliosis and spondy? Well, if you look at the old evidence, doing a laminectomy in this kind of patient is almost a 37% reoperation rate. That's, that's high. Now, what about if you do endoscopic techniques? So we published this paper looking at um, the specific subgroup of patients, uh, looking at um, uh, scoliosis or stable spondies with uh, lumbar spinal stenosis, and we compared tubular versus endoscopic. And you can see that overall outcomes were similar, but the complication rate was significantly lower in the endoscopic group versus the tubular group. Again, we're looking at endoscope versus tube. So this is even better than, than open. And if you look at this, this is a, um, a six randomized control studies looking at 646 patients comparing endo for microscope versus microscope for spinal stenosis. And you can see these are all the studies that we mentioned, two of them from Korea, um, two from Germany, and one from Saudi Arabia, and one from China. And you can see that endo had greater leg pain improvement. When you look at all this data, it has greater leg pain improvement and a decreased risk of complications. Again, it's kind of harping on the point that there's better outcomes for, for this specific uh, a subgroup. Now let's take it all uh, and kind of summarize it. If you look at the risk profile for spinal stenosis, you know, all comers, we start to see a big difference. We start to see that when you start to use endoscopic techniques, you really get, to the, you get to into the benefit zone of endoscopic spine surgery. And you can see that for, for increasing complexity, the benefits of endoscopic spine surgery are, are better seen. Now what about high complexity, high invasiveness? We're talking about cervical, thoracic, revision, fusion. This, this step, to get to this step, you have to be able to get the first steps first, be able to do a discectomy, be able to, to do a laminectomy, and then you can start applying these principles to more comp complex cases, and that's when you can really have the benefit shine. So what about thoracic disc? And everyone talks about thoracic disc. I know Sanjay's gonna talk about thoracic disc tomorrow and, and show some great videos. But I think the idea is that, that thoracic discectomies are, are not um, just procedures we can just introduce to our patient population safely without expecting that there could be some kind of serious uh, amount of morbidity and mortality. You can see that there's many different approaches to thoracic discs. You can have the, the costal transversectomy, the transpedicular extracavitary, transthoracic, the VATS procedure. Really, if you pull these, about 20% complication rate. But 26% of these procedures were associated with significant morbidity and mortality. We're not talking about just dural tears. We're talking about people being in the ICU. We're talking about serious complications for, um, um, occurring from these uh, thoracic cases. Now, uh, look at this. There's not much literature on thoracic discs right now, but you can see this is one short series, 14 patients. They had no complications in 14 patients. This is another study, 13 patients, symptomatic thoracic disc. Outcomes, excellent, good. Only one complication of dural tear. It's unheard of. Now, this is a really a recent study that just came out. I think I just read it a couple days ago. This is a, a published by Rudin. It's, it's full, a full endoscopic approach to thoracic uh, discs. And he proposed three techniques. He did an a, a interlaminar approach, a transforaminal approach, and yes, a retropleural approach. I don't understand this, but, he, uh, but apparently it works. Um, but the idea is he, uh, for the, the, the retropleural approach, he took a piece of the rib out and then it was able to go create that retropleural space and then have a more vertical access to the disc. And that allows you to access more big thoracic calcified discs. And if you look at his, uh, uh, the, uh, the pathology in this case, 49 disc herniations, 35 were harder calcified, nine giant discs. Look at his outcomes. So he had great outcomes, improvement with NERIC and VAS. The complication rate, 8%. That's a lot better than 21%. But if you kind of deep, kind of delve into the complications, you can see that for the, the majority of the complications were in the retroperal group. It's expected. I mean, the, the VATS is going to have complications. Anytime you go and, and you go in the retroperal space and you have fluid irrigating there, and something, something bad is going to happen. Um, but interlaminar group, 7%. But the only 4% with the extra foraminal. I know most surgeons here, when they use, uh, go for thoracic discs, we use the extra foraminal approach. And that's a very safe approach. And, and we'll, we'll show that in the lab. What about cervical pathology? Um, well, cervical pathology, we, we know the posterior cervical foraminotomy really is a great procedure. There are studies that show there's less adjacent segment degeneration. And it's way more cost effective compared to fusion. And what about compared to an open laminectomy or open form anatomy? Well, there's way more tissue stripping. In some of these fragile patients, you can have significant pain. You can have post-laminectomy kyphosis, a lot of wound complications. All endoscopic is doing is building upon the previous tubular approach. But the real big advantage of that is that you allow a narrow endoscope and allows better reach. 
So there's not many uh, articles looking at uh, the endoscopic uh, or randomized control studies looking at endoscopic uh, um, techniques in the, in the cervical spine. This is one, this prospective randomized control study, two-year follow-up, 86 patients were ACDF, 89 in endoscopic posterior cervical foramen anatomy. Really, no real difference in outcomes. Similar satisfaction rate, similar complication rate, but what really popped up is that, again, we talk about the qualitative difference in complications. For an endoscopic posterior cervical foramenotomy, the most common complication is gonna be transient like dysesthesias. That's the most common complication. But with the ACDF, you have, dys you have dysphagia, you can have a hematoma, you can have scar distortion in this specific series. And if you look at this, you know, this classic article from, from, from Hillebrand, you know, uh, obviously 3% incidence of a DASA segment degeneration per year, and 58% of those patients end up getting surgery. So I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the ACDF compared to an endoscopic posterior cervical foramenotomy um, has its associated risks. And you can see that this study just came out uh, a year ago, and, and it says that 20, um, at 26 weeks after surgery, 16% of patients who had ACDF still had some dysphagia. I mean, that's real. 16% of your population is having dysphagia at six months. I mean, these numbers are, these are from a perspective randomized control, I mean, perspective study that we can't ignore. So um, this is a nice, a pooled analysis of uh, ACDF versus endoscopic formonotomy. 24 studies, 1,300 patients, ACDF versus uh, uh, formonotomy. We see, again, no difference in effectiveness. We, we've established that this is as good as an ACDF. But the complication profile is different. You know, not much dif difference significant in, in terms of statistical significance. But again, the qualitative difference in complications, the ACDF, dysphagia, and implant subsidence were the most common complication. And for posterior cervical form anatomy, it's transient nerve root dysesthesias, again, which at the end of the day is not the end of the world. So this is a, you know, a quote from this, you know, this essay that was published right when surgery was first being developed. This is when the morbidity and mortality rates were 90%. And this is from Sir Astley Cooper. He said, we should ask ourselves whether placed under similar circumstances, would we submit to the same pain and danger we are about to inflict? Now this is back then when almost every patient died. We're at a, we're at a place where you know, patients turn out pretty well, but we're, we're elevating the standard. And the idea is by elevating the standard, we're, we're essentially um, allowing ourselves to expose our patients to a better, a better level of surgery by not, by not, not looking at the, the procedure in a way that, hey, would I do this on myself? And most spine surgeons here would probably pick a posterior cervical form anatomy over an ACDF. It's almost a no-brainer. So what does endoscopic spine surgery essentially do? It provides us options, options to do less harm. And Really, you, you get to see these options in specific cases, and there's certain cases where it just stands out, and the endoscopic the endoscope just screams out to you. And this is a revision decompression. Uh, this is subsidence following ACDF, causing a foramenal stenosis. This this is an easy case for an endoscopic surgery. All you do is go there and just decompress the one compressed nerve root, and then problem solved. And you don't have to deal with any going back in there doing any revision whatsoever. This is a TLF cage that backed out. This could be, you know, a large revision surgery. But what we, you know, what Dr. This is it's a Kristoff's case actually. He just went in there and shaved the shaved the uh, the peak inner body, and and that's a great elegant solution to this problem. And we, we saw um, Albert actually published this out on and using using the endoscope for for treating met, uh, metastatic uh, lesions. The idea is that we're decreasing the surgical burden for these very highly vulnerable patients. And, and I think it's great that we're looking for these opportunities to, to really showcase where the benefits of endoscopic spine surgery are. Now, what about infection? I mean, this is a great example. This is, you know, we see these cases all the time. You have a you consult for epidural abscess. This is a great use of, of inserting the endoscope to drain a ventral epidural abscess. And I actually got this video from um, my good friend, Vincent Hegel in, um, in Germany. And you can see he, he actually put this catheter in there and you see all this, all this pus coming out. And he showed the MRI post-op, and really the, the 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 epidural abscess resolved. And he did a, he did a small open um, a tubular um, laminotomy at the bottom uh, uh, of the infection, and was able to tunnel this catheter through. And then at the end of the day, um, he solved this problem elegantly without exposing this patient to a large open surgery to fully debride the spine. 
What about morbidly obese patients? Here's another patient. This is one of my patients. You can see that I had this patient. I had to figure out what am I going to do for this patient. She had a grade two spondy, had disc space collapse of five one. I, I'm, I like to do a lifts and laterals, but I couldn't do an a lift on her because she's just way too big. So I did I, I did a prone lateral, but then I did an endoscopic fusion. And uh, doing this case with a tube is very difficult. I mean, it's almost impossible. I mean, how, how long of a tube can you use? So I think. There's certain cases where the endoscope just shines, and this is one of those cases. I was able to put this cage in, a 10 millimeter cage without a problem. Now, the, the bottom line is, when you start to enter this, this realm of, of thoracic discs and, and cervical pathology and, and revision cases and fusion and tumor and infection, we start to see that the endoscopic spine surgery really has the most benefits when all the increasing uh, alternative options are becoming more complex. And I think that that's the, the main point of this talk is to let you guys know that you gotta start somewhere. But the idea is that when you have that tool in your belt, you can then apply it to so many different pathologies. And at the end of the day, by doing that, you're providing um, a better standard of care for your patients. This is just a you know, then question about orthodesis. We're still kind of early. I think tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time talking about orthodesis. And I'm still trying to struggle to find where orthodesis fits or fusion fits, endoscopic fusion fits in, in my um, algorithm. But I'm, I'm really curious to see what the, what the guys tomorrow have, have to say about endoscopic fusions. Um, so this is a, uh, just kind of bringing home. This is an article published, a 12 years follow up report, a uh, randomized control study comparing open ACL versus arthroscopic ACL. There's no difference between an open ACL and an arthroscopic ACL. Okay, rotator cuff. A randomized control study looking at the, the outcome over long term. No difference between open and arthroscopic. The question I, I want to ask you is, is how many people still get an open ACL or open rotator cuff? I can't imagine. I mean, I think, uh, I can't, I think I had one guy in my residency, dude, and everyone thought he was crazy. So, I mean, the question becomes, in 10 years, are open disc and open laminectomies, are they going to be considered like open ACLs and open rotator cuffs? That's something to ask yourself, because I think that the way the, the evidence is pointing is that that's possibly going to be one of the, one of the real realities of the future. Thank you.